The Tom Woods Show, episode 657. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi everybody, Tom Woods here. I am going to do today an episode about episodes. Now you would think this type of episode should be at a round number episode. You know, this should be episode 750 or 1,000. You know, when you get to round numbers like that, you get very reflective and you uh, become introspective at that time. But I thought, eh, what the heck? I feel like doing it now and what the heck? 657 is just as good a number as any other. And as I think about it, it's divisible by 3 and 9. That's pretty good. All right. So, and by the way, you're talking to somebody who at a traffic light is looking at the license plate on the car in front and doing the prime factorization of the number on the license plate. I can't stop my brain when it comes to numbers. I, I just I can't stop it. Anyway, let's talk about episodes. First, a little bit of housekeeping to make note of. The few items that you'll find interesting, I hope. Some of you may have struggled with the podcast uh, over the past few days. The podcast feed has had a problem and as I speak, it's being fixed. If you listen to the show on Stitcher, then you got to hear the show totally uninterrupted. You got all the episodes when they came out. But over on iTunes and other podcatchers, there were problems with at least one episode where they weren't loading, you weren't getting them on your device. I don't know what went wrong because we didn't we hadn't touched anything. But I brought somebody on who, because I don't know what to do in this sort of situation, and my tech people are not podcast specialists, so I brought somebody on, and if it's not fixed by the time you're hearing this episode, it will be fixed within 24 hours. Because, of course, the episodes are always available at TomWoods.com. You can just press play on the show notes page and listen to it. And, uh, you know, as I said, Stitcher has got all the episodes, so there are ways to hear it, but it should be fixed permanently starting uh, within 24 hours of this and this is May 9th 2016 that I'm talking to you let's see the second thing let's see what's the second thing oh the second thing is of course uh, I'm going to be linking to every episode that I mention in this episode it being an episode about episodes I'll link to them all at tomwoods.com slash 657 I don't want you driving off the road trying to keep track of all these episodes because I'm going to talk about a bunch of them that I just find uh, interesting Let's see, another quick thing. My mother just texted me to tell me my mother is in that coaching program that Sarah Young from the uh, from an earlier episode, she's the mom of seven who became an expert affiliate marketer. Well, my, my mother is in her coaching program, and she just wrote to tell me that a guy who's a teacher at my kid's school, who is a terrific, tremendous guy, just earned his first $1,000 online. Uh, b- building a niche site, you know, as an affiliate, which is what their strategy is, and it couldn't have happened to a better guy. I'm thrilled to hear that. So my my mother's doing very well in this program, by the way. She has built up such a clever niche site. It's a perfect niche. It's just off the beaten path, but the sorts of people who buy this product are fanatics about it. And there was a gap there, and she is filling it. And uh, so she's going live very soon with uh, with her site, so I'm really excited about that. I, I, I mean, if anyone in the world can succeed at this, it will certainly be her, but I was so glad to hear that this guy, I, I shouldn't mention names, but that he earned a thousand bucks already. That's just great, awesome. There's so much potential out there to, to be able to do stuff like that. Okay, so here we are at ex- episode 657, and I thought, because I've been getting a lot of brand new people lately, and 657 episodes is a little daunting. And so some of them are saying, well, is there anything before episode, I don't know, 500 that I should listen to? So I thought maybe I'll do an episode on that. But really, I think I just want to say whatever comes to mind as I'm talking here. And the first thing I'll say is that early on, and by the way, podcasters become just audio fanatics. It's just unavoidable. And early on, we had terrible audio. Then we got somewhat better audio. And then we got much, much better audio. And I would have been able to fix the audio a lot sooner if it weren't for the fact that I was working on the Ron Paul curriculum courses, which was just unbelievable. It was taking all my time to prepare and then 
do the lectures and then edit them and then get a uh, appropriate reading for them and get a writing assignment for every single one of the 400 videos I did on history and government. I just didn't have the time to look into how can I make the audio on my podcast better. I just did not have the time. So that's too bad. Now, of course, my my usual plug, if you're going to join the Ron Paul Homeschool curriculum, obviously join it through ronpaulhomeschool.com, my site, because you get $160 worth of free bonuses if you do that. You only get those through my site. So I in some of the early episodes, I just can't even listen to them. I just can't listen. <laughs> but then I think back to my decision of which person of all the people in the world I should feature on episode number one. And I thought everybody would expect Ron Paul or Judge Napolitano or Lou Rockwell or whatever. And I chose Michael Bolden from the 10th Amendment Center because I am blown away by what he's done as one person, what he's done with that 10th Amendment Center. He's a model for people who think there isn't anything that they can achieve. They're not a big name. They don't have a lot of money. Well, he could check every one of those boxes. And he's had he's made a tremendous impact. So I thought, let's talk to him. Now, in the, also in the early episodes, I, I wanted the, the show to be broadcast live, and there's no real need for that with a podcast. I was still stuck in Peter Schiff show mode because Peter's show was a real live radio show, and I used to host that from time to time, and that was live. And for some reason, I just brought that over in the podcast. I thought, ah, nah, who cares? There's no need for it to be live. I'll record it at my leisure, and you listen at your leisure, and we're, we're both happy. So what I'm going to do is uh, let me look at the episode list, and I'm going to start going through it and just uh, just commenting. I'm not going to say these are my favorite episodes. I'm not going to hurt anybody's feelings. But these are just ones that jump out at me this time I look. And if I look at the list tomorrow, others other episodes will jump out at me. What, what I'm happy about as I look through them now is the diversity of topics covered. It's a tremendous range of topics, given that, the, given that this is basically – a libertarian podcast, all the same, within that range, we've covered a huge array of topics. And secondly, I remember thinking as the show was going, I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep up this quality. How how am I going to get guests who are this good covering topics that are this interesting over the long haul? How am I going to do that? And as I look at the episodes, I actually think it has gotten better over time. So far from episode 200 being the absolute summit and then everything else has just fallen off, I think it's consistently gotten better. Now, I don't know if you feel that way, but I certainly do feel that way, and I was inclined to think the opposite. There was a golden age of the show, and now we're just sitting here, you know, like in Simpsons episode number 22, thinking about what used to be. It's it's not really the case. Uh, I really like the uh, the progress that the show has made. So... Episode number 14, I would certainly have a listen to if, you know, we talk about neocons a lot on the show, the neoconservatives, and you might not totally know what that means, and you feel like it's a term that we throw around so much that maybe there's some shame involved in not knowing what it means, but no shame. There's no shame on the Tom Woods show. No shame. Episode 14 was an episode with uh, my old friend Dan McCarthy of the American Conservative, and we talked about who the neocons are. So if that's been a subject for you, then check it out. Episode 26, I had Kane, the WWE wrestler, who, when I checked about a year ago, had 6 million Facebook likes. So, you know, that's more likes than Bob Murphy and me put together, if you can believe that. That's a whole lot of likes. So... When I had him on, that was really exciting, and he's just such a nice guy. He's such a friendly, authentic guy, and I discovered that he was actually a, a paying member of LibertyClassroom.com, and, and he said, I learn more with LibertyClassroom.com than I learned in high school and college put together. So how about that? Well, what's interesting is after that episode came out, it was linked to in a variety of places, and one of them was a major professional wrestling site. And they linked to the episode, and they said, listen to how Kane can speak intelligently about current events and technical 
economic topics and so on. And what they were really tr- sort of saying, but trying not to put it quite this way, was, hey, who knew Cain was really smart? Like, they didn't want to say it quite that way, but that was kind of what they were saying, that his appearance on my show really impressed them. Jumping back a bit, I like episode 19 because this is a walk down memory lane with Lou Rockwell. And Lou's been around the libertarian movement a long time, and he has a lot to recall. And that was a lot of fun, and it it was very informative to have that particular conversation. Let's see, episode 42 on the Gettysburg Address. It's easy to skip over that one if you're saying, well, I can't listen to all the episodes, so let me pick a few out that sound really interesting. The Gettysburg Address episode, episode 42 with Richard Gamble, is a great one. Because here he's looking at the American civic religion, basically, and looking at the religious overtones, uh, the the hints uh, the, the, of 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 uh, biblical references that you find, and and just the the overall approach that you find in the Gettysburg Address, very very interesting analysis. So I I loved absolutely loved that episode because it's it's not what you would expect. Once in a while, I do an episode on my own, like, for example, this one. I haven't done one of these in quite some time. Um, I don't remember the last one that I did that was all by myself, but episode 54 was by myself. It was Pope Francis on capitalism. His encyclical had just come out, and people wanted me to comment on it, and I just felt like I've already written The Church and the Market, which is my book on all this. And I really don't have anything else to say. I mean, that really is it. That's the whole case that I have to make. But, okay, people were demanding it. So I just sat there and just started talking. And just started talking and talking and talking about Pope Francis on capitalism. And I had people saying, this is the best episode you've done. So I have not gone back and listened to it. I don't know how it came out. But I got such good feedback about it that I thought, all right, I'm going to mention that on the episode about episodes. All right, let's zip ahead. Episode 78 is a talk I gave. It's one of the talks I'm happier with. Keynesian predictions versus American history. It's fairly meaty. So if you like these talks that I give, uh, that I make it into episodes from time to time, then 78 is one you want to want to listen to. Basically showing that the Keynesians have predicted all kinds of things based on their model that have not only not come to pass, but the exact opposite has spectacularly come to pass. I like the episode with Carol Paul. I solicited questions from the audience. I said, what would you want to answer what would you want to ask Ron Paul's wife? And I got a bunch of, of great ones and she was, as always, tremendous. Now before I go on, let me pause for a minute and point out that I am gonna have my own little step-by-step guide to podcasting. I've been promising this for a long time, but we've had a bunch of family things come up and then a health issue with one of our daughters, and it's just been crazy. So it will be next month, finally, that I launch my site. and uh, my new. I've got a new website I'm going to be launching, and I'll be releasing another free ebook. One of the chapters will be on how to podcast. I'll just take you step-by-step through what I do. There'll be a chapter on how to self-publish a book because I learned how to do that chapter on how to be a freelancer online because you can sell almost any service online and I'll, I'll uh, tell you what I know about that uh, affiliate marketing how to get started with that I mean, you might as well monetize your website why not right makes sense so stuff like that will be in that ebook and that'll all be coming out next month so I am going to be doing that if you absolutely can't wait then you can check out the John Lee Dumas podcast course at tomwoods.com slash podcast course that's absolutely free and uh, you don't need to buy anything to be able to get the knowledge that you need to get started as a podcaster. So tomwoods.com slash podcast course, all one word, is where I would send you in the meantime. All right. The episode with uh, the episode number 133 with Yuri Maltsev called The Last Soviet Defector. I knew I'd have Yuri on the show at one time or another. And he's just got a, a great story. This is a guy who was an economic advisor to Gorbachev. And finally, he wound up defecting to the U.S. in the late 80s, so he was one of the last Soviet defectors. And he didn't even realize he was going to defect. He was in Finland, and the opportunity presented itself, and he grabbed it. And he defected to the U.S., and it is a wonderful story. And I believe in that episode we even talk about the time he read 
the road to serfdom and related books, he had to sign a special agreement that he would not disclose the contents of these subversive books, but those books could be read by scholars in the service of, you know, refuting the, the terrible capitalists. So he did read those books under those circumstances. Episode 134, the Equal Pay Day scam. Every year we get Equal Pay Day, you know, talking about the need for men and women to get equal pay. They already get equal pay. This is total BS. They already get equal pay. This is just a, a, a misconception piled upon misconceptions. And in fact, you can get the transcript of that episode laying out all the fallacies of this claimed gap between men and women, you can get that in the Bernie Sanders uh, ebook that I produced, Bernie Sanders is Wrong. I use that as one of the chapters. So you can get Bernie Sanders is Wrong at BernieIsWrong.com. It's a free book. Or you can text the name Bernie to 33444 and get that book. So, so that one, if you prefer to read, that's an easy way that you can, you can just read the text of that episode. Anytime Bill Kaufman is a guest on the show, I treasure it. I think Bill is scandalously underrated. He's a brilliant mind and an even more brilliant writer. His writing just leaves me breathless. It's so good. And in fact, my 2014 book, Real Descent, I took about maybe, I don't even remember, four to six episodes that I really, really liked, and I put the transcripts of them in that book as a section of the book so that the book promotes the podcast. And then on the podcast, I promote the book. I, I try to be synergistic in this way. So, hey, as long as I'm doing that, let's go all the way here and say, you can get my book, Real Descent, which is a collection of my smackdowns, basically, over at realdescent.com, where you will also find a way to get the audiobook with me reading it for free. So check it out at realdescent.com. So you see, I did it. I just did that. Uh, another one of the episodes that I put the transcript in there was by John Hasness, The Myth of the Rule of Law, because this is based on an, a scholarly article that I read as an undergraduate, and I was very upset about it. I, I didn't agree with it. He said the, the idea of the rule of law is a total myth. It's a total myth. No matter how you craft the laws, they can be interpreted pretty much the way the judge wants to interpret them. And I just couldn't believe that. you got to be kidding me. But I was really, really shaken, and we fleshed that out in that episode number 151. Very much worth listening to. Another person whose every appearance I treasure is Pat Buchanan, because he's extremely smart. He is hated more unjustly than pretty much anyone I know. But we did an episode on Winston Churchill, because Pat wrote that book, um, Ch Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War. And the, the Unnecessary War was uh, Churchill's own, those were Churchill's own words. So we did an episode on Churchill, and Churchill, of course, is considered the man of the century and this and that, and Pat absolutely eviscerates him. So it's extremely interesting and provocative listening. Oh, and by the way, I nearly forgot, episode 117, Jared Casey of University College Dublin, Libertarian Anarchy, which is the name of the episode and his book. He is fantastic, brilliant, witty, uh, tremendous dinner company, uh, just a great guy, absolutely great guy. So I grabbed him, I got him when people were asking. I, I, I Early on with, Liber with LibertyClassroom.com, I, I asked people, what course would you most like us to produce next? Because we've got about 16 courses now. We had maybe five or six at that point. And I couldn't believe how many people said, I'd like a logic course. I thought, what are you people, crazy? But look, it's not for me to judge the members of Liberty Classroom. It's to provide for them. So who can produce a course on logic? Well, it turns out that Professor Casey's been teaching logic for 30 years. So I had him create a logic course for us, and he's got a number of exercises that you can do, and then he goes through the exercises with you. It's very good. It's very, very well done. And then he also does the history of political thought, two courses on that. But he's great to listen to. If you haven't heard an episode with Professor Casey, uh, you you got to rectify that unfortunate absence in your life. Another episode that I did by myself that I'm fairly pleased with, and again, I haven't gone back and listened to it, but I just had a real sense of satisfaction at the time, 
was episode 184 called Self-Ownership Against a Critic. Because there I was dealing with one of these conservatives who, you know, it's not like there are no conservatives who have cogent critiques of libertarianism. There are. But a lot of the time it's, well, I read a half a sentence and so now I'm going to go into my Edmund Burkean lecturing of these stupid backward libertarians. It was one of those. And I thought, no, 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 had enough of this sort of person. Had enough. This is going to be a smackdown. So I did that in episode 184, and I remember being pretty happy with it. I liked the episode with Charles Calamiris, episode 213. Charles Calamiris is a professor at Columbia Business School. And uh, earlier, I, I, or I don't know if it was earlier, it might have been later, I had a professor hamburger from... Um, the, uh, from Columbia Law School, so it was surprising to me that I was able to get two Columbia professors, because believe me, when I was at Columbia for grad school, uh, I didn't find anybody who was sympathetic to anything I had to say. So, um, and in fact, I even had a chance later on, maybe this was five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, I, I don't remember, but not that long ago, uh, I actually was invited to speak at Columbia Law School, which was fun <laughs> for me to go back there. Anyway, what causes banking crises? I remember listening to an episode of Econ Talk with Charles Calamiris while I was driving somewhere, and I was so <clears throat> I was so blown away by his knowledge and by how interesting the episode was that I thought to myself, if I ever have a show of my own, I'm getting this guy on, and I did that. Now, he, the, here again is an episode that you can read the transcript of because I used, I liked his episode so much that I made it into a chapter of another free ebook that I give away called 14 Hard Questions for Libertarians Answered. And you can get that ebook by texting the word liberty to 33444. All right, let's, let's talk a little more here. Um, the state is not a public service agency is episode 231. That is a talk I gave at the Mises University, Mises, uh, Mises Summer Program of the Mises Institute, and I think it's the best talk I've ever given in terms of content and delivery. To my mind, that's the best. I am really, really happy with that. And in fact, I think that's the type of talk that if you can just get somebody to listen to you, to listen for 45 to 50 minutes, I think it's the type of talk that can change people's minds, that can really get them thinking. I really thought that one through quite a bit, and I tried my best to pack the biggest punch possible so that it would have that effect. I hoped it would have that effect. So that's how I feel about that. Let's see. I'll skip that one. Um, a lot of people really liked Matt Mahai's episode 251, The Transition from Communism, The Case of Poland. People liked that episode a lot, so maybe you will too. Episode 257. I'm really happy with this episode because I, I really had a very, I had an original idea, and I think it's a really, really good idea. This has never been done before, but if you go to college and you study economics, you're going to study out of a mainstream text. And I'll tell you something, in that text, you're going to read a lot of stuff that you're going to wonder about, but there's nothing written about these subjects in the Austrian treatises. You'll go to Human Action or Man, Economy, and State, and you'll say, what's the refutation of this? It's not there. It's not there. So I wanted an Austrian to go through chapter by chapter every single chapter of a mainstream college textbook in economics and do an Austrian critique of it. And Jeff Herbener did that for me, and he appeared on the show to talk about that process. And that was great. He did that for Liberty Classroom. Uh, so if you join Liberty Classroom, you got that course. Uh, I also, I was so happy because, I mean, that's got to be done. That had to be done. And now it's done. Never been done before. So I even make that available if you are a silver and above at supportinglisteners.com. You also get that course. It's another way to get that course. So that's a goodie. That's a definite goodie. I had Michael Scheuer on the show. Now that was a real thrill for me. Because, of course, he was the, the head of the CIA's bin Laden unit in the late 1990s, and he was a big Ron Paul supporter, particularly after the famous exchange in the debate with Rudy Giuliani. He came out and supported Dr. Paul big, big, big time. 
and I became very interested in his work. I don't agree with him on everything, but he came on to talk about the bipartisan foreign policy from his point of view, just tremendous. Mark Sisson of the Primal Blueprint, I only wish I could be more faithful to the Primal Blueprint, but of all the interviews I did when I would guest host the Peter Schiff Show, my interview with Mark Sisson was by far the most influential because I got people for years afterward coming up to me and saying, I listened to your interview with Mark Sisson on the Peter Schiff Show, and I lost 50 pounds effortlessly, effortlessly. I was eating bacon. I was eating all the meat I wanted, I mean, basically meat and f- fish and poultry and fruit and vegetables and nuts and, and you know, all this stuff that you can have um, and more. You can have and not count calories. You do not have to count a single calorie. You eat until you're full, and you will lose weight. And forget about all this, uh, I have to avoid fat. Well, some fat you want. You do want some fat, actually. So episode 266, I talked to Mark Sisson on my own show. I've talked to him twice since I've had this show, and I've I've seen the effects. And plus, how could it be bad to eat that type of diet, right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's obviously a good thing. So I would check that out if that has any appeal for you. Let's see what else here in the top 300. Yeah, how about this? The Ebola scare got a lot of people wondering, what would libertarians do about Ebola? Because wouldn't we just say, well, you know, liberty trumps everything, so let's let an infected person run around and infect everybody. And yeah, sure, it means the whole human race will die, but hey, you know, liberty... Well, is that really the libertarian position? So I thought, who better to have on for that than Bob Murphy? So Bob came on. We talked about that subject. And I think I think it's a pretty persuasive answer, if you ask me. And we might have even put that in the 14 questions book. I can't remember. That might be in the 14 questions book. All right, let's look at some more memorable episodes. And I'm sorry, there are too many of them, right? I'm trying to limit myself, but it just seems wrong. Episode 272 generated a lot of controversy. It was called, Am I a Dummy for Believing in God? Because I was just tired of all this, oh, you might as well believe in the flying spaghetti monster thing. And I thought, oh, come on. If you don't know anything about something, at least have the decency to shut up about it. Um, And it was my belief, which I believe is uh, well justified, that people have about as great a chance of being exposed to Thomistic philosophy in school as they do Austrian economics. That is to say, no chance. Or if they are exposed to it, as with Austrian economics, they will learn it only in caricature. So I've heard all kinds of different explanations or uh, all kinds of different um, people telling me what Thomas Aquinas meant by his various demonstrations for the existence of God. And these things are not at all what Thomas was saying. Not at all. Not even not even in the same universe with what he was saying. But we've all, to the extent that we've heard that he had such arguments, we've been taught to believe uh, caricatured versions of them. That he never, uh, never uttered. No, no one of his intellect would have uttered these things. So I took this episode to explain, just, just to take one argument that you would have seen from the medieval schoolmen about you know, demonstrating the existence of God. And this, of course, is a metaphysical demonstration, so it is qualitatively different from so-called empirical evidence. A metaphysical demonstration likewise compels our assent if the demonstration is valid. So I went through and explained this, and I then afterward explained why the flying spaghetti monster can't possibly qualify as God. Because one of the arguments is, even if Thomas Aquinas did prove there was a God, he hasn't proved that this God is a trinity, or he hasn't proved uh, proven that uh, this God must be only one. Why couldn't there be a hundred gods? Why does the God have to be immaterial? Why does the God have to be outside of time and space? And so on. And what I did after going through this proof was then to go through the various divine attributes that we, as it turns out, these happen to be attributes that we associate with traditional Western theism. Uh, for example, that God is one. I mean, the, the, the Trinity is something that that uh, really can't be just derived from, from reason, obviously, but that God is one, is immaterial, is uh, 
is all powerful, is out, must be outside of time and space. These things follow logically from where Thomas takes you in the demonstration. So that so I take the first half of the episode to talk about the demonstration, second half of the episode to derive the divine attributes, which is, by the way, something that that idiot Richard Dawkins says Aquinas doesn't do. What are you, are you insane? That's, yeah, he spends hundreds of pages doing this. How could somebody be that wrong? I mean, shockingly wrong. He spends hundreds of pages deriving the divine attributes from his conclusions. So it's, uh, so I spent some time doing that. And, and that does show, by the way, that, okay, if, if the flying spaghetti monster is flying, can't possibly qualify as God because God has no unactualized potentiality. But something that's flying is actually at point A, but potentially at point B. And when it's done flying, it'll be at point B. It's moving from from uh, potency to act, but God has no unactualized uh, potency. So he can't be flying. I mean, and this is all shown in the, this is all part of the demonstration. He can't be material, likewise. And uh, it can't be a monster. I mean, just everything. It, just, it can't, this, the whole thing is dumb, and, and it's, what annoys me about it is the same thing that sort of annoys me about Matt Iglesias and you know, people on the left who think that their three sentences refute Austrian economics and make us all feel silly. Okay, well, this is even worse. Three words, flying spaghetti monster, is supposed to refute hundreds of years of scholasticism? I don't think so. Not happening. So check that out if, you're, if your brain can resist exploding. But you'll, you'll, uh, you'll at least find it worthwhile. And then afterward, you should read Ed Fazer's blog, F-E-S-E-R, Ed Fazer's a friend, Edward Fazer, again, F-E-S-E-R, dot blogspot dot com. And you'll say, okay, I have to admit, I have not encountered this intellectual tradition before, and I didn't realize there were smart people who have obviously reasonable things to say on this subject. I didn't know about it. And and it's, it's no wonder, because somebody like Dawkins, what does he spend his time doing? He debates faith healers or whatever, you know, completely irrational people. And you think, well, I guess that's all there is out there. Well, when Ed was set to go up against him in debate, uh, apparently Dawkins figured out who he was and then backed out at the last minute, which I would do too if I were Richard Dawkins, because he was about to run into a buzzsaw. And he has refused to debate Ed ever since. Well, okay, well, Ed in his books has already ripped uh, Dawkins' head off figuratively, so that's already been done. But anyway, check that out, and, um, you know, please don't tell me anymore that I'm a stupid idiot who uh, doesn't believe in evidence. I mean, come on now, you're better than that. All right, number 282 is another goodie, because it's Jim Grant. Remember, Jim Grant is the guy Ron Paul wanted to name as Fed chairman. He is fantastic, brilliant, witty, smart, quick on his feet. His testimony before Ron's congressional committee was just a speech for the ages, just beautiful. And he and Jim Grant has a book on the Forgotten Depression of 1920 to 21, which I've written on a bit myself, and we had a great conversation and he sent me such a nice note afterward about it. So that's memorable. I was so thrilled just to be able to have him have him on there. Also for people who are getting bombarded with this claim that we have to rebuild the military. You know, it's been allowed to decay. We have to rebuild the military. The great expert on that is Winslow Wheeler, who recently retired, by the way. But while he was still working, I got him on episode 287 called The Pentagon's Fake Austerity. And he will take you through the truth of the matter. You don't want to miss that. I'm not a huge J.R.R. Tolkien fan. I'm not opposed to him, but I'm just, I just, I guess I just don't like fantasy novels all that much. And I'm sorry, I know I'm supposed to like The Lord of the Rings, I know, but I just, I don't feel invested in this. It's, it's one group that's not human against another group that's not human. I just, I haven't got a dog in this fight. Whether the woozles or the wuzzles win just seems immaterial to me. So I just can't get interested in it. But I know that 99% of people who listen to the show love him. And we did a great episode with Jay Richards, who's the author of a book about Tolkien, called Tolkien and Liberty, that uh, I think you'll enjoy. That's number 293. So you see, I mean, before episode 500, boy, we had some goodies. And, you know, this one's funny because the, the 
the trajectory of, uh, you know, the, the path that gas prices have fallen over the past several years has really been all over the place, hasn't it? I mean, it's been, it's been up and down, up and down. And we're back to gas at you know, roundabout, general ballpark of $2 a gallon. And when that happens, you get articles by people saying, it's terrible for gas to be this cheap. We need it to be more expensive. And you think, why would people say that? Oh, believe me, they have they have their reasons. I mean, mainly it's because they, they, they like suffering. They want people to suffer. But it's also that the more expensive it is, the more we'll conserve and this and that. But okay, but that would be true of any good in the world. You know, we could make every good a thousand dollars a unit, and then we'd really conserve on them. But that that's completely arbitrary. So it, we've run full circle because back in December two thousand fourteen, we had two dollar gas. Then it went back up. Now we're back to about two dollar gas. So the episode number three hundred five is two dollar gas. The worst thing to happen to America is suddenly relevant again, and that's actually one of the better. Um, I as I recall, that's one of the better. Murphy episodes. I really, uh, I really, really enjoyed that, that one. And, and as I say, that's really relevant. Uh, last episode of the year, 2014, was my episode on how to become a better writer. And it was, I think it's just under 20 minutes with some advice from a guy who has written, I don't know how many words in the course of my career, but it's many, many, many. It's certainly well into the seven figures with, with, uh, without breaking a sweat, I would say. And that's number 311, so maybe there's some, there are some nuggets in there for you. Oh, one of my favorite talks of all time. Oh, my goodness gracious. Episode 326. Oh, boy. This was January 2015. So you got the, uh, the presidential election is actually heating up, and Rand Paul is in the running. And the Mises Institute was holding an event on secession. Mises Institute holds an event in Texas, in Houston in particular, every January. And this year, the theme was secession. So I was going to speak, and Brian McClanahan from Liberty Classroom was going to speak, and uh, Lou Rockwell and Jeff Deist, and Ron Paul. So the Washington Post shows up, and I love the Mises Institute. You know, they, unlike uh, a lot of libertarian groups... They don't kiss the you-know-what of, of the media. The media shows up, and the Institute says, okay, uh, and uh, you know that'll be $85 to get in. I mean, you got to pay to get in. We're not going to give you some press pass where you get in for free. You know, We're going to let you come in for free and eat our food so that you can denounce us in the newspaper? What are you, crazy? My, one of my favorite stories of all time is the New York Times showing up at the Mises Institute, and when Lou Rockwell got wind of the presence of the New York Times, he, he came right downstairs and said, uh, you are a mouthpiece of the regime, and you are not welcome here. And he ordered them out. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay, that's that's a libertarian right there. No bootlicking, none of that. Well, we had this Washington Post reporter in the audience, and I couldn't tell people that. I, I wasn't gonna. I, I didn't want to go down that road. Um, I wanted, but I wanted the reporter to know that I knew he was there, and that I knew what he was up to. He was there to say, oh, there's crazy old Ron Paul saying crazy things that are going to make his son uncomfortable. So I gave a talk that was implicitly directed right between the eyes of this Washington Post reporter about the completely warped priorities, moral priorities of the American media and political classes. I said, secession is just a matter of drawing a border in a different spot. Big deal. Like, that's the big, terrible thing we're not allowed to think about. It's okay to completely destroy a borderline third world country, or, you know, between second and third, let's say. That's fine. Based on lies, oh, well, you know, hey, everybody makes mistakes. That's okay. No one's been driven out of public life for that. But if you say this boundary line belongs here rather than here, you're a crazy extremist who should never be heard from again. So it was 30 minutes of that directed right between the eyes of this SOB. And what do you know? Who was the one person whose speech was not quoted even in one sentence? Mine. Because what could he take from it? It was all a rebuke. And it was great. 
Yes, that's right. I'm coming right out and telling you, I gave a great speech. And if you haven't heard episode 326, you are going to love it. Yeah, maybe that's one I should go back and listen to just to get myself pumped up again as I head out to the Mises event in Seattle uh, later this month. Boy, was that fantastic. All right, what's the next one here? What's the next one I want to talk about? Oh, yeah, this one didn't get that many listens. I couldn't understand it. Maybe it was my stupid title. 331. It's called No Progressives. Lower tax rates on the rich don't wreck the economy. You get this a lot. Progressives say, oh, look at uh, economic history. When tax rates on the rich have gone down, the economy has blown up. This is just stupid. It's, it's just wrong in every particular. And we just dismantled it so well. Oh, so great. Episode 331. All right, so it, it, it got only an average number of listens first time around. But now, in the episode about episodes, we are going to revive that episode. It's going to see new life. It's going to be great. Another talk that I gave that you might enjoy, more lighthearted, but um, you, you'll enjoy it. 335, How I Became a Libertarian. That got a lot of listens because of the title. People are curious. I think you'll like my story. So that's episode 335. 343 is maybe my second favorite talk I've ever given. And for the episode, I called it What I Told Conservatives About Foreign Policy. This is the speech I gave in Los Angeles in 2011 before a nullification event. And it was a mixed crowd in the sense that by no means was it all libertarians. And indeed, we had some people who were uh, obviously who were veterans of the Persian Gulf War and so on and so forth. And I had to make a decision because I had planned to spend 15 minutes of the speech on foreign policy. And I'm sorry to tell you that I briefly considered dropping that. But I thought, well, you know, this maybe that's not right for this audience. But no, it's precisely this audience that needs to hear that. So the last 15 minutes or so is where that speech suddenly takes a shocking turn. Because up to that point, yeah, I'm edgy because I'm talking nullification. It's impossible not to be. State nullification of unconstitutional federal laws. But at the same time, there's some conventional red meat, you know, Obama's a bad guy and this and that. So I build up capital with the audience, and then I spend every bit of it by telling them that they are better than this. They are better than supporting a foreign policy that basically requires them to be immoral and callous. And it was a, it was a moment I'll never forget. And, and uh, I've never been able to reproduce that moment, actually. Um, I, that may be my most extraordinary moment for me, maybe spiritually, I guess, in giving a talk would be that. The second best would be speaking at Ron Paul's rally for the Republic in uh, 2008. Uh, I was shut out of that 2012 one by people who are now in trouble with the law. I was shut out of that. I was going to be there, and they shut me out. So that's okay. I was with my friends over at the Paul Festival, uh, the, the, the non-respectables. We all had our perfectly good event. You all know who you are if you were there in Tampa. We had our perfectly good event with uh, hardcore people who were great, and I was proud to be with those people instead. All right, what else here? What else? Oh, yeah, the CEO of Overstock.com. Patrick Byrne. Now, if you're interested in entrepreneurship or if you're interested in just, just plain vanilla libertarianism, you're going to love hearing from this guy. It's wonderful that somebody like that is a CEO. And he took, he's just got a great story. He took Overstock.com from a million dollar company to a billion, with a B dollar company. Just very, very interesting. And it's one of my favorite lines. I, I repeated it in a recent episode. Uh, where he said, he said, if you don't kick a man when he's down, when are you going to kick him? I, I just, I'm sorry, I like that. I like that line. So that one's worth uh, a listen as well. I did a talk by myself on, on here because I was in the middle of doing the Ron Paul curriculum stuff, and I had just done the Russian Revolution for one of the Western Civilization courses. Those courses, by the way, are at TomWoodsHomeschool.com. If you want to just buy them a la carte, but if you'd like to get them as part of the Ron Paul curriculum, then ronpaulhomeschool.com is the site. Well, anyway, I did this, this uh, episode on the Russian Revolution, which I think is one of the most interesting topics in all of human history. And P 
people really, really liked it. The, the response I got was totally overwhelming. They really liked it. I did an episode, the very next one, episode 400 on Ayn Rand. And I brought on Michael Malice to talk about Ayn Rand because he's uh, very fond of, of Rand, although not, not uncritical, but he's very fond of her and very knowledgeable about her. So we had a great conversation in that episode about the good things and the bad things that we see in Ayn Rand. And I'll, I'll say something about Michael Malice. I would say that basically every episode he's been on should be listened to, every episode. I know a few of the – he did a couple of episodes on North Korea that the download figures were not so high because people thought, oh, it's North Korea. Who cares? No, 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 no. You're disappointing me. No, please listen to them. Please listen to them. You're going to say, oh, he was right. I'm so glad I did go back and listen to these. Any episode with Michael Malice is going to be great. He's top-notch on North Korea. He's so knowledgeable. But honestly, whoever that young woman was who introduced me to to Michael Malice and, and made me familiar with him, I am deeply grateful to you because we've become friends uh, as a result of this. Of course, we had that, that great debate in New York City where I, I uh, beat the stuffings out of him. But he's a good guy, and in fact, a few weeks ago, I was really down in the dumps about just some things that have been going on, and uh, I talked to him, I think we talked till about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I almost tweeted out, there's no problem so large that it can't be solved by a two-hour phone call with Michael Malice, but that, I, I, that seemed like it might be more than 140 characters, and I was too tired to do the math, so I just went to bed. So anyway, Michael Malice episodes... Uh, definitely, I got to get him back on soon. Maybe, maybe I'll try this week. See what we can talk about together. All right, uh, what's another one? Oh, this one. This one also got relatively low download numbers, and that is such a shame. Now, there, I'll grant you. I'm not going to mention names, but look, you do 657 episodes. They're not all. They're not all going to be worthy of an of an Emmy. And there have been a few where I felt like they were kind of clunkers. They didn't quite click or something. And if they had low download figures, well, I'll just you know, happy to keep it that way. But this is a shame. Bill Kaufman is a national treasure. Episode 425 is called Beyond Red States and Blue States, The Real America Versus the Televised America. Wonderful conversation with Bill. I'm telling you, Bill Kaufman is going to be somebody you're glad you know about. I, I feel like part of the reason my show exists is to give a bigger and louder voice to people like Bill who, if there were more justice in the world, would be a, a household name. Well, you know, I have what I have. I have I have an audience not as big as the big radio hosts or anything, but it's a good, solid core of, of decent and loyal and, and wonderful and generous people. And I get to introduce you good folks to people like Bill Kaufman. And that's what, all, another thing I've been happy about uh, on the program. And that's what I started to get feedback about very early on, that, Gosh, it's you know you've done a hundred episodes, two hundred episodes, three hundred episodes, and you're constantly introducing me to new and interesting and smart and insightful people, and it gives me hope. I'm heartened because I realize that the the liberty movement has a deeper bench than I thought it did. You know, it's not just Peter Schiff, Judge Napolitano, Ron Paul, and Lou Rockwell. You know, we have a, we have a lot of great people. So that's that's been really gratifying too to be able to do that. Of course, having Walter Williams on the show has been a real privilege. I've done that twice. Uh, early on, I think it might have been around somewhere around episode 82 or so, but then episode 428 was great when he came back. And then one of my listeners brought uh, Walter Williams to his school to speak to the students, and he had never heard of Walter Williams until he was on my show. Now, when I, I was growing up, I used to read Walter Williams' columns in the newspaper all the time. I loved the guy. But this listener had never even heard of Walter Williams and then loved him so much, invited him, and then the students got exposed to him. So it's, it's great that the show has that kind of ripple effect. So that's why that episode jumps out at me when I look at the, the list. Then, you know, we've tried to get this guy back on, and it hasn't worked out so far, and I, I really hope we can do that at some point. Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, we did an episode called Is Reason Enough? Why Your Opponents Won't Listen. And we talked about how you persuade people and how you, well, don't persuade people. And that had a very, very profound impact on a lot of people. I heard a lot of feedback on that, so I would recommend that. Episode 432 is the audio 
Oh, actually, no, I, I beg your pardon. No, let, let's skip 432. 432 is when Michael Malice and I debated Alexander Hamilton just here on the show, and only later did we decide to do a live in-person debate uh, in New York City, and then I made that into an episode as well. So I'll get to that one later. That's the, that's the one that really counts, because that was a lot of fun. It was longer. It was Oxford style, uh, and, uh, and very, very memorable, at least uh, for the two of us anyway. I got much, much more feedback than I expected from the George Kalansis episode called Early Christianity on War and the Military. Mike Huckabee would not have fit in, episode 452. That was very, very interesting because this indeed is information that I think would come as quite a surprise to a lot of the uh, Christians who are very, very... Well, let's just say they're not looking at war really as a last resort, except they, they say that rhetorically, but, but that's about it. You know, it's funny, as I think about it now, I'm, I haven't gone through and looked at episodes that people really didn't like or I got a lot of negative feedback on, so I should have done that, and th- that just didn't jump out at me when I looked at the episodes. I, I definitely got a lot of pushback on the Laurie Calhoun episodes on Just War Theory. I, I did get, get pushback on that, but I also got a lot of favorable response to that. All right, let's see. Episode 475 was great because I had Stephen Walt on, who's a professor at Harvard, and the, the episode was called Iran, the Myth of a Better Deal. And Walt, of course, got in trouble for his book on uh, the Israel lobby, but, you know, he's a professor at Harvard. What does he care? So it was, you know, he's something of a celebrity, and it was great to have a you know, I thought a very, very enjoyable and productive conversation with him. Then maybe you might like episode 478. This is me all all by myself. How a libertarian would teach a government course. Because as it turns out, I have a little experience in that area because I created a government course for the Ron Paul curriculum. And I'm telling you, if I knew the stuff in that course, if I'd known that stuff 20, 25 years ago, can you imagine the agony I would have saved myself? The frust- the hours and hours and hours and hours of reading and researching and looking things up and mastery, I have slimmed down all that knowledge to 90 video or audio files, according to your preference. And it's now it, it gives both sides, unlike the typical government course, which just takes for granted, well, of course, government needs to do X. It doesn't even consider the, the possibility. So I look at, okay, here's the argument for why government needs to do X. But now, how about this? Let's consider the other side, because it turns out there is another side. Is there a reason government shouldn't do this? It covers almost any topic you can imagine is covered in that particular course for the Ron Paul curriculum. So I think you'd like episode 478. Again, if you were a high school student and you took that course, you would have such, you would have such an overwhelming advantage over your peers. I'll just leave it there. All right, let's move along. Let's move along. Oh, one of the biggest episodes in terms of feedback was 481 with Dr. Josh Umber, How Capitalism Can Fix Healthcare. He talked about his own practice and how by staying away from government and Medicare and insurance companies, he's able to keep his his prices at rock bottom levels. And it that episode blew me away. And again, you can read the transcript of that episode because I made that transcript a chapter in my Bernie Sanders is Wrong book. Wow, that episode knocked people's socks off. Strongly urge you to listen or to read it in the book at BernieIsWrong.com. For, let me scroll a little bit, looking on my screen here. 497 is another Pope Francis episode by myself because I was somewhat criticized by somebody in Fortune magazine. And boy, I, you know, when I get criticized in, in a you know, reasonably high-profile outlet, I make an episode out of it, or I make an email out of it, or I, you know, usually run with it if I have time. And I, I did have a little time at that point. So I think you'll like that one, too. I was pretty happy with how that one how that one came out. Um, I think somebody is, you know, Scott Horton, I can't pick out what's his best episode. Um, most of my listeners really love him. And I just can't pick out what his best episode is. So I've got 499 written down, what to tell your friend who says Saddam really did have WMDs. But really any episode with Scott Horton, you're going to have to listen to several times. You're going to get an awful lot out of it. 
I like uh, the episode um, Pierre de Rocher, how libertarians won the bet of the century. Because here, this is great. I mean, between the the doomsayer and the optimist, and the optimist wins this famous bet about the price, the the trend in in uh, certain commodity prices. So it's it's it, it really is worth listening to because. This really was the bet of the century, and our side won hands down. 517 is the next one that I've got written down. And this one also, I was disappointed, had low download figures. And it's called Two Conscientious Objectors from the Air Force Tell Their Story. Well, these are two people who basically encountered Murray Rothbard's ideas while they were in the Air Force, and slowly but surely that wore them down to the point that they applied for conscientious objector status. It is a great story. They're a husband and wife, and it's a great, very, very interesting story. So if you missed 517, um, consider listening to it, because it, it, I, thought it was, uh, I thought it was wonderful. Also wonderful, and featuring one of my supporting listeners, was comic Dave Smith, episode 526. That's one of my memorable ones, too, because he was so, so easy to talk to. I didn't even feel like I was doing an interview. It was absolutely flowing and flawless and enjoyable. It didn't feel like work in any way, which shows how good Dave is at what he does because he is first and foremost an entertainer. And he kept me entertained. He sure kept the listeners entertained. I got tremendous feedback on episode 526. So jot that one down as well. So, you know, basically you got to make a cross-country drive so that you can get to all the episodes covered in the episode on episodes. All right, let's see. I've already talked about Michael Malice. Well, look, I had Milo Yiannopoulos on the show talking about feminism back on episode 576. He's a hard guy to get back on the show, but we're going to try and do that if possible. Maybe you could put a little pressure on that guy. And the thing is, I, was not re- I wasn't ready for him. I'll be honest with you. I was not ready for him. And if you listen to episode 576, he basically runs that interview. I mean, I, he is just walking all over me. Like, I don't even know what hit me in that episode. He basically took charge. I'll be ready next time. I, I had fun. I'm not regretting it. It's just funny. <laughs> he came in. He was like a hurricane. I was not expecting that at all. And if you, if, you, if you do get my emails, if you're on my list, I sent a couple of emails out relating to, um, to Milo. And as a matter of fact, let me write, let me write something down for myself here. Uh, Crowder. Oh, I want to get that Steven Crowder on. He's hard to get on. But, yeah, all right, I'm going to write to write to AJ after I finish recording this and remind him about that. Wait, what was the other one? Oh, yeah, yeah, let's see if we can get Wendy McElroy. All right, yeah, yeah. Sorry to, sorry to be doing this while I'm supposed to be entertaining you with the show, but if I don't write these things down, you know, I'm getting to be an old man. I'm going to forget them. All right, what's the next one? 597. Okay, yeah, this one is in many, many people's top five. 597, Can the Private Sector Protect Against Crime? This case study will blow your mind with Dale Brown. Wow, the, with the Detroit Threat Management Center. And he shows how they, you know, they did things that the police could not or would not do to at least provide some kind of civilized life for people. And the cleverness of their tactics and the way they avoid violence is amazing. It's amazing. That episode, that's got to be in the top five of what I'm telling you also. I would say that's that's definitely got to be up there. Um, I think I skipped, uh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I skipped, I skipped. 551 is the audio of the in-person New York City debate I did on Alexander Hamilton with Michael Malice. Um, I would just go to tomwoods.com slash 551 so that you can watch the video because the video is great. The video is 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 just great. I mean, for reasons you'll see, it's very much worth seeing. So, uh, 551. Then 552. Don't skip that. That was fun. Uh, Michael and I just kind of hash it out about how the debate went, and that might sound just like self indulgence, but it it really turned out. Yeah, maybe it, indeed it was in in conception, but in execution, I think it turned out to be quite entertaining. All right, uh, let's go back. Six oh six. Karen Katowski's become another favorite on the show. So 606, she's been on twice, so listen to them both. 606, 
was called She Saw the Liars Up Close, Lieutenant Colonel Karen Katowski on the Iraq War Propaganda. She, she um, well, we talked about her experience at the Pentagon and her own intellectual evolution, which is was mainly the subject of the second one of the interviews we did together. But I, I just getting bombarded with emails. You've got to have her on back, back on. Got to have her back on. So I got to just think of topics. We can think of topics that I can have her on to talk about. I would love to do that again because uh, people went berserk for her, and I knew they would. I don't know why it took me so long to have her on. One of the bonus episodes I'm going to list as a uh, as one to listen. It's on Pope Francis, and not on economics, but just on the state of the Catholic Church and the the politics of it all. And that's why I made it a bonus episode, because it's not strictly a libertarian episode. But I had a lot of requests for that subject, so I thought, well, if people are not interested in that, then they still get their five episodes a week on topics that are more directly related to the the podcast. And also, it's a great episode because I'm on with Roger McCaffrey, who is one of my favorite guests, and actually, he's he's actually one of my favorite people. Uh, I hope that isn't too sappy sounding, but he's a great guy. So very informative and fun, as is the episode later in that week, regular episode with Roger McCaffrey, Trump, Buchanan, and the Death of the Political Consultant. That is, because also, because Roger worked very closely with and for Pat Buchanan in 1992 when he ran against George H.W. Bush, and there are a lot of interesting stories from that that are worth knowing about. All right, now we're getting closer to the present here. I had... By popular demand, I was finally able to get Christina Hoff Summers on the show. We talked about feminism, and I know she enjoyed that episode. So I I, I could get her back on. I don't think it would be a problem. Feminism versus free speech and a free economy. She's been fighting the crazies for years and years and years, and it was a thrill and an honor to be able to talk to her on the show. 637. Oh, Eugene Yelchin. Wasn't he great? Wasn't he great, the author of Breaking Stalin's Nose, this young person book that, let me tell you something, entertained this old person about what life was really like in Stalinist Russia. And then we talked to the author, who himself moved to the United States from the Soviet Union in 1983. So we talked a lot about his own life and his own experiences. Wow, wow, was that great. And I got such a nice note from him complimenting my knowledge and my ability to run an interview and he said he's somebody you could very easily become friends with and I thought what a nice thing to say so if I'm ever out in Los Angeles I'm going to look him up and we're going to have dinner together because I'd love to get to know him better that was a lot of fun and then episode 649 with James Kalb very recent one but I put that on there because we had a difference of opinion and I think it was it was hashed out in a way that was fun and But yet, in a way, it was kind of unfair to Jim, because the second half of his book lays out his vision of, of the good life, basically. And he's talking about that in the episode, but since we only talked about the first half of the book, he was kind of arguing with one hand tied behind his back, so that was kind of unfair. But we still hashed through some interesting ideas, so I guess I would recommend that one to you as well. I mean, there's so many. I mean, look... You, You almost can't go wrong. I I won't elaborate on that. (laughs) There are a few where you can go wrong. You say, what the heck did I just do? But for the most part, I'm, you know, I'm happy. I'm happy with how it came out. And um, look, most, in the same way that most nonfiction books sell fewer than 2,000 copies, nobody knows this. Everybody thinks you write a book and it sells 30,000 copies. Selling 30,000 copies of a nonfiction book is a miracle. It is a it is a down it is a miracle, so you should read my Lou Rockwell article. Nobody sells millions of copies, where I tell people the the terrible truth of nonfiction book sales. But in the same way that most books sell fewer than two thousand copies, most podcasts get fewer than two thousand. Uh, I beg your pardon, fewer than two hundred listeners. Most podcasts would be delighted to have two thousand. But although I, I the um, the exact size of the audience is a bit of a trade secret here at the Tom Woods Show. Nevertheless, it is in the tens of thousands, and it's you know it's grown stead- slowly but steadily uh, since I started it. And when I first started, I really didn't have time to promote it because again, I, all I was doing was that Ron Paul curriculum. And now I've just been too absent-minded to to really really push it hard. But you folks have been doing some of that work for me by spreading the word to friends and 
letting people know about it, sharing it on on uh, social media. And by the way, a free way you can help me is that if you're on my Facebook page, not my regular profile, which I never use, but my so-called fan page, facebook.com slash Thomas E. Woods, just click like on my posts. Just click like. Even if you don't really like it that much, just click like. Because the more likes they get, the more Facebook will show them to other people. So that would really help me out. If you could click like and occasionally share something, then, you know, that helps me build the audience and then we can we can do a lot more. So that is my episode about episodes. I'm going to tell you one quick thing. You know how on the show from time to time I have been promoting something called Ebates, which I use, by the way. I bought, um, my, my daughter was quite ill and I bought her a huge uh, flower arrangement through Ebates. Um, I forget which flower company I use, but I, I went through Ebates and I got a $40 cash rebate from that. So I use Ebates. I also I use Hotwire a lot for my travel, and I go through Ebates for Hotwire because I get cash back from that. So I use Ebates all the time. But Ebates gives you the cash back at all these different places. But this week, May 9th, 2016, this whole week, they're doing 15% cash back on over 250 retailers. 15%. That's a lot of dough. So sign up for Ebates if you haven't done that already through TomWoods.com slash Ebates. All right, tomorrow is going to be uh, a War and Peace style episode. Then later in the week, we're going to do a, uh, we haven't heard from Norman Horn in a while from LibertarianChristians.com, so we're going to try and talk to him. I'm going to see if I can get that weasel Michael Malice back on the show, and uh, then I'll fish around and see what else we can do. So thanks so much for listening. The The show notes page, remember, is TomWoods.com slash 657. We're going to link to all these episodes, if you can believe that. So check out that resource, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.